not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The light meant everything to Gwyn. For before light, he was nothing. Imagine being a nameless member of some primitive congregation, barely scraping by in a harsh, dark world. Then, you come across a most glorious sight, light. And by that light, you find a soul. Not just any soul, but the most powerful soul. One that carries with it the power, no, the responsibility, to lift your race out of the shadows, onto the surface, where the dragons dwell. Gwyn did not win this first war overnight. We forget this, but during the Age of Ancients, there was still time for the Lords to rise. Civilizations were built, alliances were forged, loyal knights were appointed, and betrayers were born. For after disparity came creatures that were not born equal. Creatures like Seath, who lived without the immortal stone scales of his brethren. With his mortality came a desperation, an ambition, a jealousy, things the stone dragons never had, and could never understand. And so, with their secrets betrayed by the Pale Drake, the dragons' homes were burnt to ash, their scales were pierced by lightning, and their flesh was exposed to disease. The war was won, and Gwyn could have eliminated Seath here, but he chose not to. Instead, he did just the opposite. He granted Seath a piece of his very own soul, he elevated him to the peerage, he granted him dukedom, and also the hand of his daughter, Guinevere, with whom he could sire royal children. Honouring Seath like this ended up costing Gwyn his closest battle compatriot, Havel the Rock, who harboured this deep hatred against the scaleless dragon. Havel is not found in-game, but deep within an Orlando, behind an illusory wall and protected by a mimic, are his armaments, alongside the occult weaponry designed to kill a god. From this we can guess that Havel nursed this resentment for Gwyn, though it seems he never acted on it. At this time, after all, Gwyn was surrounded by his entourage of knights, many of them wistfully craving this return to the combat that had once given them purpose. Gwyn would repeat this behaviour throughout the Age of Fire, keeping his friends close, and his enemies even closer, for fire was at its peak, and the whole world was charmed by its brilliance. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. To Nito, Gwyn permitted a quiet domain for all of the deceased, and in return, Nito never did spread death to the gods. Over in Isoleth, the witch was tolerated despite spawning her creatures of chaos. But there was a fourth lord, one that I didn't mention when talking about the Dragon Wars, but one who took part in them just the same. The furtive pygmy race and their descendants. The pygmy lords, squirreling away a soul of dark, represented the most significant threat to Gwyn's Age of Fire. So what do you think Gwyn did? Exterminate them? No. Instead, Gwyn indebted them with the greatest gifts of all. While the pygmy lords waited patiently for light to fade, Gwyn twisted their fate, prop up this tiny race, bathe them in the glory of the light, blind them with its brilliance, give them a crown, a ringed city, his youngest daughter, let them indulge in bounty, and while they're still weak, raise a dragon to watch over them, seal their dark with fire, and shackle them to mortality. Let them spread across the earth and forget their heritage, their accomplishments. Let the origins of humanity be buried out of sight and out of mind. So the pygmies were walled off, safe in a city that exists only at the end of the world. Most of them stayed there forever, happily subservient to their princess Filianor, whose very slumber was a miracle that was designed to prevent time from passing. Meanwhile, Humans, the pygmy's ancestors, had spread to the outside world, and out there, they too warmed themselves by fire. However, unbeknownst to most of them, this ran counter to their true nature. In the dark, 
There are no shadows, but where fire resides, shadows twist and shrivel. So some members of the dark did sense that something was wrong, and they began to ram against their shackles. First, a mad king was born to the pygmies, and he was undying, as the dark should be, so he was held in a dark room until the end of time. Later, yet another pygmy lord would go on to spawn an abyss when he was unearthed in Ulysil. And over time, even mankind turned into monsters. This hollowing process that unfairly became attributed to their darkness instead of the fire that branded them. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Gwyn's favoured tool of control was the church, something he had used to great effect already in the Ringed City, and he would use it again now to indoctrinate the people of the wider world. Gwyn the White was their deity of worship, and Lloyd the Grey was at its head, acting as a sort of intermediary between gods and humans. They framed undeath as a terrible sin, and so the undead became the subjects of undead hunts, led by cleric knights charged to cleanse the unholy. And if such a cleric, God forbid, actually became undead themselves, then there was a solution to that too. Such ironically cursed humans were shipped off to Lordran and given a new holy mission, retrieve the right of kindling from the deadly catacombs. And if you should fail, well, so what? Gwyn had basically dressed up exile for his undead clerics, but one man whose exile he did not spin for once was the banishment of his firstborn son, the nameless king, god of war, and leader of the Sunlight Covenant, had his godhood rescinded after it was discovered that he was fraternizing with dragons. This was something he covered up. In addition, it seems like Gwyn's captain of the guard, Ornstein, went on to leave his post in favor of the nameless king. And so too, it appears, did Havel, whose knights arise in the nameless king's defense at Archdragon Peak. A war had been fought in the name of disparity, yet how righteous truly was their war against the ancient, unchanging, everlasting dragons when Gwyn himself refused to cede to the natural order? But Gwyn's manipulation would not last, for the Nameless King was just a crack in the dam, and the wall was set to burst. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Many alliances broke, seemingly all at once. Gravelord Nito had become increasingly reclusive, and the right of kindling had been lost within his domain. Isolith had defiled flame, and Gwyn's war against her demons had weakened his armies. Seath was trending towards madness, the Way of White had begun to worship Lloyd instead, and there were even whispers that Karth, one of the primordial serpents, had begun speaking the truth about the pygmy lords. Gwyn's light was waning, illusions could keep it alive no longer, and some people waited for a dark lord to be born amongst humans. Was Karth right? Was he fighting against the inevitable? Had he found the wrong soul? No, he was Lord Gwyn, august, magnificent, and if he was not yet worthy of worship, then it was because he had not yet made a great enough sacrifice. So Gwyn would link the fire, leave a mark, perform a miracle that was so great, a sacrifice so complete, that it would bring the world back from the brink of darkness. And it worked. Well, too well. Gwyn was consumed, and with his dying breath, utterly defied disparity. The world became cursed, and from this point on, every time an age of fire dwindled, the souls of lords would flourish anew, so that it could all play out again. The timeline of fire had warped. It had turned from a straight line, linked into a circle, becoming this wall containing the rightful age of dark until the end of time. Eventually, as the world burned out over and over again, Ash itself would arise, a new being 
created from a thousand failures who had tried to link the fire over the years. But Ash did not belong in this world, and honestly, they had more in common with the beings of the painted world, where all of fire's discarded things reside. So, they fought for a new purpose, to reunite the Dark Soul, and to paint a new world with it so that they could escape the ashen wasteland that Gwyn had created. And so, far away, at the very end of the world, one of the first victims of the curse, Slave Knight Gale, hollowed beyond belief, also sacrificed himself for a new world, and he did not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. If you're watching this video in the first week of its release, then we have a limited edition print of our new merch design now available below in the description. This time it's inspired by both Dark Souls and Elden Ring, and it's a new collaboration between myself and Seabot. So Elden Ring is now said to be a sort of spiritual successor to Dark Souls, and just so, I wanted to design a piece that links the two together. This is Fate. It's this ink-styled knight with bright red hair that's inspired by Elden Ring's designs, and he's reaching for a flaming sword that's inspired by Dark Souls. The red hair part of the design is the limited edition variant, and it's only available for the coming week and then never again, so check it out. Our next week's video is going to be on Elden Ring, so stay tuned for that. There's been no news about this game for months now, I think it's about time we start making up our own Elden Ring content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you all enjoyed this Prepare to Cry, and I'll see you all next time.